All right, let's turn, turn, take our Bibles and turn to uh, Psalm 127. Uh, Psalm 127. And uh, we're going to read the whole chapter there. It's not very long, uh, but just a, a few uh, verses. Uh, for, our, for the day, I want to emphasize, as I've been talking about for several weeks, about um, having a strong Christian home in a changing society. Uh, and the truth is, a lot of times, we have the idea that um, our generations are facing what previous generation never faced. But I think that often we say that because we forget the past. Uh, you forget how the 60s were. Uh, you know, all the things that happened during the 60s. I mean, you can look at history, and the fact is, history always repeats itself. And uh, our generations are here that are alive today are not facing something that previous generations have not faced. Uh, it's just been repackaged. Now, here in Psalm 127, I want to read the verses that we find here, uh, verse 1 through 5. And the Bible says this. Except the Lord build a house, they labor in vain that build it. Except the Lord keep the city, the watchman waketh but in vain. It is vain for you to rise up early, to sit up late, and to eat the bread of sorrows, for so he giveth his beloved sleep. Lo, children are an heritage of the Lord, and the fruit of the womb is his reward. As arrows are in the hand of the mighty man, so are children of the youth. Happy is the man that hath his quiver full of them. They shall not be ashamed, but they shall speak with the enemies in the gate. I want to consider here, the Bible says that children are an heritage of the Lord. And obviously here he is talking about uh, the home and uh, the heritage of the Lord and how children are arrows uh, in the hand of a mighty man. Uh, now, as we think about the family today, there is no doubt that uh, the foundation of the home in America are crumbling. They're changing. That's right. Um, the Bible says, if the foundation be removed, what can the righteous do? And so, there's a lot of ideas today that are circulating about the home, about the family, about children. And so, I, I, wanted, I wanted us to, to, to think biblically this morning and deal with some unbiblical ideas that have creeped into the Christian home. And what I mean by that, we could say philosophies, thoughts, ideas today that are prevalent, that are being said, that have creeped into the Christian home to where we now adopt uh, those philosophies or those ideas that are being promoted today. Uh, I was uh, reading a, a, a poem uh, that I thought I'd share with you. By, the author was unknown. Uh, but the poem goes like this. If Jesus came to your house. It goes like this. If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two. If he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the good you serve to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him there. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched in welcome to our heavenly visitor? Or would you maybe change your clothes before you let him in? Or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you turn off the radio and hope he hadn't heard, and wish you hadn't uttered the last loud and hasty word? Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymn books out? Could you let Jesus walk right in, or would you rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you'd always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep up its usual pace? And would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the book you read? And let him know the things on which your mind and spirit fed? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you'd plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans or just for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends or would you hope they'd stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh and with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do 
if Jesus came in person to spend more time with you? And I think that there's a truth to that. I think to a certain extent we uh, look at that and we know that if we had an encounter with the Lord, things would change. I think nobody would deny that, even in my own home. I'm sure that the things would change quite drastically if His presence were there. But I want to consider here because the fact is, the family is under attack today. The home, I mean, I'm talking about, when I'm talking about the home, I'm talking about the Christian home. Um, and much of what's going on today, uh, the world's philosophies have crept into certain areas that are clearly laid out in the Word of God. And so I want to uh, spend a few moments to deal with some of those unbiblical ideas that have creeped into the Christian home. Number one, I want us to deal with the unbiblical view of dependence. And what I mean by that is children. Uh, if you do your taxes, and this is kind of the season up to April, uh, you have dependence. You can claim dependence, and you can. And when your children are out, you can't claim dependence anymore. And so, when I speak of dependence, I'm talking about children. That there's an unbiblical idea regarding children today. What does the Bible says? The Bible says that children are a heritage of the Lord. Now, consider that for a moment. You know, these are things that are commonly heard today. Well, Pastor, you don't understand. We cannot afford to have children right now. That's being said today. And I'm not talking about the world I'm talking about in Christian homes. Uh, we want to wait about five years, ten years. We want to get to know each other before having children. That's what's being said today. I'm talking, I've heard that. Uh, or someone says, uh, well, we just want one child because, you know, it's, uh, children are a lot of work. Uh, children are too much work. Uh, I've even heard people say, I'm not going to have children. I don't think I can handle it. Some people would say, well, you know, children are, are too much of a burden. Some people say, we like to be free. And those things are ideas today. I'm not talking about in the eyes of the Lord. I'm talking about in the Christian home. These are things that perhaps you have heard. These are things that I have heard Christians speak as they think about their marriage or their future. I remember talking to a young man saying this to me right off the bat. I told him I had five children. He says, wow. He says, well, I don't want any kids. Where does that come from? Where does this idea of children, this view of children, come from? And so on and on we could talk about the opinions and the excuses that would come, but the Bible makes it clear that children are a heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is His reward. Uh, and so children, we have to understand that, biblically speaking, children are a blessing from God. Let me say that again. Children are a blessing from God. They are. Uh, I have known uh, even people that have had several children, uh, uh, children and uh, when they had children, they were unsaved. And often when they get saved, they look back now and they say, well, our, our mind was shaped towards children, but if we were Christians, now we wish we had more children. Now often that's what we hear. Now, let me pause and say this, that there is no formula to follow where you say, well, you need to have this amount of children. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say you need to have 24 children. The Bible doesn't say you need to have one child. The Bible says children are a heritage of the Lord. And the fact is, today in society, we cannot say, well, this is what every family needs to look like. This is what every family needs to be. There are some people that can have many children. Some people can't have as many children. And so we can't uh, wrap our mind and think, well, this is the way it needs to be. The Bible says that children come from the Lord. It is what He gives. It is what He imparts. And so that must be the idea as we think about children and the family. And so there's an unbiblical idea of view today that is scripted into families where they have the idea now that, well, you know, you can't have too many children. We live in a different stage. You can't afford children today. Or, well, make sure you're ready before you have children. What does that even mean? Nobody's ready before they have children. Nobody's ready. You really, you know, when we had our first child, we were happy, but we weren't ready for it. <laughs> I mean, we grow up in a certain environment, and my wife and I both grew up in a Christian home, but we weren't ready. <laughs> and you now understand, after you have children, oh, that's why my parents did what they did. 
That's why they said what they said. And so you begin to understand that. Uh, but again, uh, Genesis 33, 5, you remember when Jacob met Esau? And Esau was a carnal man. Uh, and uh, Jacob, too, for most of his life was a carnal man. But the Bible says, and he lifted up his eyes, Esau, and he saw the women and the children and said, Who are, the, are those with thee? And he said, The children which God hath graciously given thy servant. That was the idea of children in the Word of God. It is a blessing from God. God has graciously given me children. And so that is the view of children. Uh, so we have to be uh, very careful today because that has creeped in. Uh, the world has convinced the Christian families that they cannot have many children. Just have one or maybe two because today you just can't have a big family. You know, and people often are afraid of the sneers and the comments. I remember I took, I decided to adventure myself and I took four of my kids to Cabela's. By myself, all right? <laughs> and so I went there and drove over there. I thought they'll enjoy it, you know, all the animals. And uh, it's just a fun place to go. You got the fish and uh, behind the glass. And so it, it's a free activity. Hello. <laughs> And so I thought, well, I, I'm going to enjoy it, so let's all go out. And so we all went out, and so I get out of the car, and then someone in the distance says, wow, how many do you have in there? <laughs> the world. The idea of children is, well, this is not right. This doesn't look right. And almost criticizes, belittles people that have a large family. That is not a biblical idea. To say, well, you know, uh, this is the world we live in. Uh, and often I, I really believe that this is the world's influence that has crept into the home. And really I believe that many of the Christians' home have become selfish. They, 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 they have this idea today. Well, I have a bucket list. I have things I want to do. Uh, you see, life is made for enjoyment. And, you know, if, if I have more than one or two children, uh, you don't understand, uh, I, that's going to cripple me. Because there's something I want to do. Uh, there's a buck list I need to fulfill. And often people, uh, they adopt, gladly adopt this view uh, so that they can consume this life upon their own lust. There's things I want to do. There's places I want to go. And there's a career I need to have. And I don't want anything to come in the way. And often children will come in the way of those things. It is sad that Christian homes have adopted that. And say, well, we got things we want to do. Life, we see here, that dependence, children, are a heritage of the Lord. It is the blessing from God. And so we see, first of all, the unbiblical view of dependence. But number two, I want to deal with the unbiblical view of discipline. Let me say this as uh, kindly as I can. Children today are out of control. I'm not talking about teenagers, I'm talking about children. Um, we could speak at length of, into statistics, but let me put out forth a scenario for you. Have you ever been at the store, and you're walking down the aisle, and you see this little girl with her father walking down the toy aisle, and he's just walking about to make an exit in the store with his groceries, and the daughter says, well, uh, she picks up a toy and she follows her father. By the way, that's happened to me as well. You just you watch the kids. They'll take things <laughs> without you noticing. She follows her father with this uh, toy. And the father finally turns around and sees his daughter and says, um, you know, put it back. We're not buying a toy today. And so she will begin to cry and to scream. And the father continues to say, no, put the toy away. Put the toy back. And the more he says no, the louder the scream gets. <laughs> Finally, after a third or fourth time, the father says no. The daughter drops the toy on the floor, stretches her back, leans on the ground, stops stomping her feet, shaking her head, and screaming, but I want this toy! I want this toy! And the father says, well, okay, well, look, look, we're not going to buy this toy. I'll get you something at the, a little snack at the cash register. Is that okay? No, I want this toy. Well, look, I'll get you something else, but just not this toy. Uh, no, I want this toy now. I don't want anything else. I want this toy. 
Okay. How many times has that happened? Countless times. In the United States, the United States has one of the highest teenage pregnancy rate among all industrialized nations. In the last 45 years, teen suicide rate has increased by 60%. Suicide is the second leading cause of death among teens today. In the United States, in the year 2000, 10% of all murders were committed by teenagers. Sinful behavior in children is often labeled as sickness today, as a disorder. There was an article that was written uh, to list the illnesses or the sicknesses today, and these are labeled sicknesses. They call this, uh, the first uh, one of them, and there's many of them, but one of them that was listed as an illness was this, conduct disorder. Conduct disorder, which is this, also known as disruptive behavior disorder. It is a disorder that involves chronic behavior problems during childhood and adolescence, including stealing, fighting, and bullying others. And that is labeled today as a sickness, as an illness, conduct disorder. Well, I want to say every child is sick then. But that's labeled today as a sickness. It's labeled, and you see the philosophy has creeped in, well, there's nothing you can do about it. That's just the way it is. There is what's known as oppositional defiant disorder. Like ODD, right? Odd, that's odd. <laughs> a participant pattern, it is a, participant, a persistent pattern of disobedience. Hostile and defiant behavior towards various authority figures. And that is labeled as a illness. It's a disorder. Uh, another one was, I thought this was hilarious, risk-taking disorder. What? Uh, this, they label this as risk-taking behavior, any action that increases the likelihood of injury or death. And that's now today labeled as an illness. Uh, let me say this as kind of as I can, as plain as I can. These are not illnesses. These are called sin. That's what that's called. And, but again, this philosophy today has creeped into the Christian home. You know, Proverbs 13, 24 says very clearly, He that spareth his rod hateth his son. Let me read that again. He that spareth his rod hateth his son. But he that loveth him chasteneth him betimes. Disciplining children. That is a biblical principle. It is not the idea of men. It is a biblical pr pr principle. You know, there's philosophies today being promoted all over. There's so many books, so many podcasts, so many uh, YouTube channels. Every mother wants to start their own YouTube channel on how to raise children. And it's honestly getting ridiculous. There's a book that was entitled Be Beyond the Sling, uh, which is uh, it was, uh, a mother who uh, uh, really promoted attachment parenting. You ever heard of that before? Attachment parenting? And this is what uh, they would say. It is, it is meeting the need of a child, but what their definition of a need is different than my definition of a need. Uh, they sleep in a family bed. That ain't happening in my house, I'm just saying. <laughs> the child is rarely put down. Uh, this is the philosophy. We let the children determine the course of what we do. That is the philosophy. And look, it is creeped into the Christian home. I have, a Christ, I have heard of Christian families with children saying, well, you know, we want them to discover themselves. We want them to, uh, you know, we follow along and we want to make sure that they don't get hurt as they do things. Dr. Sears' book entitled The Baby Book, Everything You Need to Know About Your Baby. Amazon described the book as the baby Bible of the post-Dr. Spock generation. This is, this is in modern days today. It's known as the baby Bible. You say, well, who's Dr. Spock? Anybody know Dr. Spock? Dr. Spock has influenced more homes than we, I think, are conscious of. How, uh, there was an article written on how Dr. Spock destroyed America. This article was written in 2009 by Red Bradley uh, with, the World Daily, uh, with the World Net Daily. This is in his article, these are just portions. He says, Spock's child-rearing book, Common Sense Book of Baby and Child Care, first published in 1946, sold 700, uh, 750,000 copies in the first year, has since sold over 
50 million copies. And according to Dr. Spock's website, it is the second in sales only to the Bible. Now think about that, that influence. Life magazine certified the depth of his influence, naming Spock among the 100 most important people of the 20th century. Within a decade after Spock's first book, a, per a perceptible change began to develop in American families. Under Spock's influence, parents were watching their children become sassy and contentious, and increasing numbers were seeing them become juvenile delinquents and criminals. Over the last 50 years, this out-of-control behavior has led to a 300% increase in the rate of violent crimes. Instead of stressing the importance of teaching self-denial and respect for authority, Spock emphasized accommodating children's feelings and catering to their preferences. No longer did children learn they could endure uh, Brussels sprouts and suffer from daily chores. Using Spock's approach, parents began to feed self-indulgence instead of instilling self-control. Homes were becoming less parent-directed and more child-centered. As parents elevated children's freedom of expression and natural cravings, children became more outspoken, defiant, and demanding of gratification. In fact, they came to view gratification as a right. That's the Spock influence. And today, many people have run with that where it's all about the child. Give the child what he wants. And I believe that to a certain extent this was reactionary uh, to a lot of the discipline that is unbiblical in that many parents and families have turned into ang in, in, in anger and have wrongly disciplined their children. No child should be disciplined in anger. There has to be self-control on the part of the parent, and often m m many of what was much of what was taking place today, because of the uh, of uh, really a uh, over-the-top disciplining, uh, things were being done that were really not biblical, uh, where uh, uh, where uh, children really were being abused. And so no doubt this is a reaction, but it's going all the way opposite, where there is now no discipline of children whatsoever. Proverbs 22.15 makes it clear. Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. You get that? Foolishness is bound in the heart of a child. Well, there's nothing you can do about it. You just got to accept it. They just got deficiencies. No, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Proverbs 29.15 says the rod and reproof give wisdom. Do you get that? The rod and reproof give wisdom. Uh, if a parent has the idea where they don't discipline their children, uh, they are not instilling wisdom, they're instilling foolishness in their own children. The Bible says, A child left to himself bringeth his mother to shame. I remember speaking with a, a young man who was describing his childhood and his parents, and he said, My parents didn't love me. And I said, Well, how could you say that? He says, They let me do whatever I wanted to do. You know, I, I still can't get over that when I, my children do something wrong, whether they lie, hit their brother and sister, and this is a daily occurrence uh, m m most of the time, they're confronted. And often they will be disciplined uh, for doing the wrong thing. I have never disciplined my children in love. Let me, uh, let me say this again. I have never disciplined my children in love and have them stump out of the room in anger. Almost every time they turn and they give me a hug and they say, I love you, without me asking for that. You see, even a child knows that he is doing wrong, that he is in the wrong, and that he needs to reprove for doing the wrong. You can see a child is guilty. When he's about to do something, he looks. Are they watching? He knows it's wrong. You see, foolishness is bound in the heart of the child. He will do those things. And the child has and must be restrained or else it will be the curse of that child. It must happen. You see, misbehavior in a child can often be traced back to the failure in the parents to properly train and discipline a child. The perspective of children, how does... God view children. You see, the home is the most fundamental and basic foundation of society. One of the purposes of marriage is childbearing. Now, I understand there's sometimes people can't have children. 
Uh, and so, uh, and, and so we, that, that, is, that is the case. But I'm saying that God uh, told Adam and Eve uh, to replenish the earth. That was part of marriage. You see, undisciplined children will be the curse of a nation. Undisciplined children will be the curse of a nation. So we see, number one, unbiblical view of dependence. We see, secondly, an unbiblical view of discipline. But thirdly, I want to deal with an unbiblical view of development. And what I mean by that is today we, we look at development in the life of a person and we uh, ascribe certain stages. We say, well, there's the baby who can't do anything for himself. Uh, then there's the child. Uh, then there's the pre-adolescent years. Then there's the teenager. Then you're a young adult, a college age. Then you're middle age, you know, you're still discovering yourself. Uh, then you get married, you become older and uh, wiser, and then you uh, have senior citizens. And that's how we kind of break up everything. People often tell teenagers, and this is, I hear this in the Christian home. Uh, you can grow up in your 20s. Just wait. And enjoy your time now while you, uh, while you can have fun, and then you can think about becoming an adult. You don't need to be responsible now. Just do that later. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians 13, 11, and he said this. When I was a child, he said, I, I, I spake as a child. You know how children speak? <laughs> I understood as a child. I thought as a child. Do you get those three things? They, they describe the maturity of a person. Their speech, their understanding, and their thinking. He says, when I was a child, I uh, thought, I understood, I spake as a child. But when I became a man... I put away childish things. You see, there is two stages there that the Apostle Paul mentions. There's the child stage and the man stage. Or the child stage and the woman stage. In 1 John chapter 2, verse 12, uh, the Bible describes here, uh, John's writing to believers scattered born. He says, I write unto you, little children. Because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you little children, because ye have known the Father. I have written unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. So we see here, I believe here, these are the biblical stages. There's child, young man, father. That's, the, that's what we see, the progression. Little children, young men, father. In other words, a child needs to become a man. And when he becomes a man, he can become a father. You see, the three stages of development are listed. Children, young men, or men, and then fathers. Uh, these are, are fine throughout the Word of God. Uh, let me illustrate that. The word man is found 200. To, uh, two, over 2,700 times. The word men, 1,600 times. The word child, 205 times in the Word of God. Children, mentioned 1,800 times. Young, mentioned 300 times. Youth, mentioned 70 times. The word teenager is found zero times. The word young adult is found zero times. A young man in the Word of God is defined as a male between the ages of 12 and 30. You get that? A young man in the Word of God is described as a man between the age of 12 and 30. Do you remember the young man that came to Jesus Christ in Matthew 19, 20? The Bible says, The young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what like I yet? He was 40 years of age, the young man. Or under 40. 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 42, And Saul said to David, Thou art not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for thou art but a youth, a boy, and he a man of war from his youth. And so we see here again from his childhood he's been trained. Now a young man's character is developed during his childhood. 
And so we'll see what we've done here is that it's crept into the home where we have the idea that certain stages bring about certain things in the development of a child, and then we adapt to whatever the world says happens during those times. The terrible twos. That means that the child is out of control. Well, don't let him be out of control. <laughs> well, you know, this, you know, pre-adolescence, you know, it gets a little complicated, but then teenagers, oh, teenagers, uh, people, you say, well, enjoy your children now, you know, wait till they're teenagers. Uh, my dad often say that when people would tell them, and he says, look, you, you get what you expect to get. You expect your children to be rebel, but perhaps they'll be rebels. Uh, you expect your child to be terrible twos, but perhaps you'll be terrible twos. And so I'm saying here that uh, the, those ideas, we have convinced ourselves, well, look, this is the, the, the stage they're in, and so there's nothing we can do. No. That is an unbiblical idea. You see, a young man's character is developed in his childhood. I, th I remember, the, if you go back to the life of Samuel, uh, when his mother prayed for Samuel, and Samuel became, she took him to the temple, and the Bible says, and Samuel, being a child, worshipped God. When he was a child serving in the temple, he gave the message to Eli, the Bible emphasizing during that time that he was a child. I mean, he was under 12 years old. And the Bible says, as a child, all of Israel understood, and it was established that he was the next prophet. As a child. And he is the prophet that, that went from the transition to no kings to the first king. But when was that developed? It was developed in his childhood. That is when the character, uh, the character traits must be instilled in the child. You say, well, what things, what, what are you talking about when you're talking about development of the child? We have to get children from the stage where they have immature speech immature understanding, immature thinking, and translate that into mature thinking, mature understanding, mature speech. And that has to be a transition from a child to a young man, to a man in his youth, until he develops and where he matures to where he can lead, if the Lord wills, in his life into a family. And so it is important for us to understand the biblical development of a child. We have adopted today, and often uh, even churches have adopted that philosophy. They say, well, okay, well, we have, a youth, we have a youth department. And in their youth department, they say, well, okay, well, they're youth. So in their teenagers, you basically, they're, they're supposed to enjoy themselves. And so let's uh, schedule some activities. Uh, we're going to take them to Six Flags. And we're going to do this with them. And we're going to do this with them. And, uh, and churches today have even spent all of their time and their energy, and they've invested thousands of dollars into trying to give teenagers what they want. And they've neglected that is a, a development of character that needs to take place in the lives of teenagers. That is when discipleship of teenagers. Learning character traits. Learning how to become mature in the speech. But this is what we've adopted in churches. Well, look, teenagers, they just talk like teenagers. No, that's child talk. Well, you know, teenagers, they just don't understand what goes on. That's why teenagers, they don't need to be found in another room listening to all kinds of music and doing activities. They need to be in church listening to Bible preaching. But we've adopted that. We've said, okay, well, this is, this is what they are. They don't understand things of the Bible. No, they need to understand things of the Bible. Their speech needs to be developed into maturity. Their understanding into maturity. And... They're thinking. You see, the thinking has to be adjusted before they get out of the home. <laughs> Not after. Say, well, when they get out, they'll, they'll understand. No, no, they need to understand now. And so, I'm dealing here with the unbiblical view of development. And see, we've adopted kind of those ideas of the world. I mean, by the way, that came from the 60s. That rebel music started to emerge. And so we thought that's what, and they've created that environment that just teenagers are rebels. That's just what they are. No, they're not. They should not be. They must not be. Their character must be developed. But I want to deal with one more. And that is perhaps a more subtle one is that is there is an unbiblical view of direction. You remember when Paul wrote to Timothy he said to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3.15, and that from a child, 
Thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Now, Paul is writing to Timothy, who was a, he calls him a young man. Let no man despise thy youth. Well, he was a pastor, so he wasn't a teenager. He was a grown man, as we think in our estimation today. But he says, let no man despise thy youth. But what was the pattern in Timothy's life? From a child, he knew the Holy Scriptures. You see, as a child, his, uh, uh, he, he uh, was matured in speech, in his understanding of the Word of God, and in his thinking. You see, God expects us, He expects the Christian to raise your children for God. Let me say that again. God expects the Christian parents to raise their children for God. Malachi 2.14 says, Yet ye say, Wherefore? Because the Lord hath been witness between thee and thy wife, and the wife of thy youth, against whom thou hast dealt treacherously, yet is she thy companion, and the wife of thy covenant, and did not make one, yet had he the residue of the Spirit, and whereof one, that he might seek a godly seed. What does God desire? God desires this. He desires a godly seed. He didn't say a moral seed. He said a godly seed. One that is after God. You see, the goal of each parent should be to raise their children for the Lord. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 through 9 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our, uh, is our God, is one Lord. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy might. And these words which I command thee this day shall be in thine heart, and thou shalt teach them diligently unto thy children, and shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thine house. You get that? Thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thine house. Thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thy house. Thou shalt talk to them when thou sittest in thine house. If you've read that five times, I know. Because that's neglected today. He goes on, and when thou risest up, and thou shalt bind them for a sign upon thine hand, and, thou shalt be, uh, and they shall be as frontless be between thine eyes, and thou shalt write them upon the posts of thine house, and on thy gauges says that raising children for the Lord is part of all of our lives. But often what's happened today is that uh, today education is emphasized. Well, I want my children to be educated, and I want children to be educated. They ought to read. It's a thrill to my soul to watch my son David learning to read. It's a thrill. But you know what I'm thinking? I'm thinking one day he'll be reading the Word of God. One day he'll be able to take the Word of God and see that what we read and what we preach is the truth. He will receive that one day. He's learning to read the right way, too. I like it. Some people today, they emphasize sports. There's a, I, I played sports growing up. These are good things that can instill uh, good things and work ethic in a young person. But often, people, they, that's all they emphasize. Well, you need to be educated. You need to make it through this world. Or, uh, well, you need to do sports, you know. Uh, I failed when I was a young person, but let me live my life through you. Let me make you the greatest softball player ever. Let me make you the greatest basketball player. Well, I wasn't able to make it to the uh, professional uh, sports, but I'll sure try to make my son and my daughter get there in the Christian homes. I've watched fathers, mothers spend countless hours getting their children trained for sports. And look, if your children do sports, spend time with them. I'm emphasis, spend time with them. Be with them. You, the, you are the one that ought to be teaching them. But can I say, that's not what life is about. There's things you can do with your children to train them in certain areas, to teach them work ethic, to teach them discipline and things like that. But that is not what life is about. God will hold us accountable for raising godly children. People will invest their time to train a child in the areas they deem important. Now let me pause and say this. It is possible... For a family to raise their children for the Lord and their children not serve the Lord. <coughs> Let me say that again. It is possible for children to raise their uh, for parents to raise their children for the Lord and their children not serve the Lord today. I have seen families that have uh, uh, you know four children and one of those child goes astray. That's it can happen. They've received the same training. Uh, some serve the Lord and some decide not to serve the Lord. Uh, ultimately, children uh, will uh, uh, will. Uh, take their own direction because they have their own free will. But it should not be the fault of the parent that they go astray. It should not be because the parent has emphasized the wrong thing and provided a wrong direction for their children. 
You see, also, uh, often families, they have relegated the responsibility to raise their children to the church or to a Christian school. They said, look, uh, Pastor, look, I don't do things in my home, but look, I take my children to church and I hope the church will fix them. The church cannot fix what's been put to death in the home. Let me say that again. The church cannot fix what's been put to death in the home. It will not happen. Some people say, well, look, I took my children out of the public school system. I placed them in a private school. I placed them in the Christian school, whatever the case may be. And they have the idea that that's going to make a child good. That's going to make the child succeed. And they relegate their own responsibility to someone else. You see, it is the unbiblical view of direction. God has given us, the parent, the responsibility to raise their children for God. And the parent is to provide that direction to his children. Children ultimately one day will make their own decision. But we have to make sure the parents that we have done our responsibility. God is not going to hold us accountable for the decisions of someone else. But he will hold us accountable for our decision. The decisions and the determinations of our lives. Uh, that we have made to raise up children. Let me say this. There is no perfect family. There's no perfect parent. There is no parent that has it all together. As a matter of fact, when I listen to um, believers, Christian homes that have trained up their children for the Lord, they often say the same thing. They say, how did it happen? They say, it was the grace of God. Because there's no guarantee that all your children are going to live for the Lord. There's no guarantee whatsoever. And so the only testimony I've heard is not because, because even those people says, I have failed. <laughs> These people readily admit that they have failed often in their lives and in their families. And so they attribute that to the grace of God. And, the, and, and they return, the, uh, say, the grace of God because it is not, and we have to uh, be able to deal with that, but we must say we've done our part in raising children. And so I had a few more, but we'll stop right here. And so let me reiterate those. The unbiblical view of dependence, your view of children, the unbiblical view of discipline, the unbiblical view of development, and the unbiblical view of direction. And so may the Lord help us, because these ideas, these philosophies have crept in, have creeped into the Christian home. And now Christian homes have adopted those views and say, you know what, yeah, that's, that's, let's make that part of our lives. It sounds right. Uh, we must find the answers in the Word of God and get our ideas from the Bible. And when the ideas comes from the Word of God, it is always right. It is always right. And that's a confidence that we can have in the Word of God. Let's